Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a sailor's knife. So this is a really fun and interesting project, pretty complicated, uh, a lot of moving parts to this knife and I think you'll learn uh, a lot of stuff here. Uh, it's going to have a hamon, um, I'm starting out with a big uh, thick piece of stock and flattening it out. There's just a whole lot of interesting things that we'll get into in the course of making this knife. So uh, let's go ahead and jump on into it. The size and shape of knife that I have in mind will need to be made from some pretty large stock. Since I don't carry flat stock in this size, I'll need to forge it from something really brawny, like this big chunk of 1086M that I acquired from Howard Clark a decade or so ago. I'll use a sequence of different shaped dies to widen it, draw it out, and flatten it to the size I need. Eight or so inches of round stock elongates to about 20 inches of flat stock. Next, I'll knock off the scale on my belt grinder then flatten it on my surface grinder. So, now we're actually ready to start the work for real. The design for this custom-made knife is based on a design from a longtime customer of mine, Lauren Stein. Here's Lauren's design. And then here's where I ended up with my own CAD plans. One of the interesting things about translating a paper design into a physical object is that you have to make sure that design is actually doable using the tools and techniques you have at your disposal. I've done a separate video on the subject of that process, which I'll be putting out in a few days, explaining how I came from Lauren's sketch to my final design. I'll link to it once it's complete, so you can see how this made it from page to design. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure what makes this a sailor's knife. My client designed it as a sailor knife, and so I'm assuming that Lauren has plenty of reason to think that this is going to fit the intended use. I'll begin by drilling the holes for the handle. As I've mentioned in most of my videos, I prefer to drill all the holes before doing anything else. The reason for this is that it's far easier to properly clamp the stock when it's square than when it's been shaped into an irregular knife shape. I'm marking the holes mainly as a bozo check, not because I'm actually locating anything with them per se. It's easy enough getting something out of whack and you can't undrill a hole. I'm using the DRO on my mill to drill them exactly to the numbers found on the plans that I made. That way I can drill them exactly the same way on my handle scales and everything will fit perfectly. As with most of my knife builds in the past couple of years, I'll be posting these plans on my Patreon page. Link in the cards and description. Anybody who supports the channel on Patreon, no matter how small the donation, has full access to the library of plans. So check that out and help yourself while helping the channel. Once I've got the holes drilled, it's onto the grinder to rough out the profile of the blade.
Hey guys, just a quick shout out to our sponsor, Combat Abrasives. I use Combat Abrasives belts on my grinder every day. Their ceramic belts in particular are cost-effective workhorses in my shop with one of the best price points in the industry. Combat is a family-owned American company with manufacturing facilities right here in the U.S. of A. They've also just released a new two-part epoxy, Rogue Epoxy, that has a thousand uses for the knife maker. Find them at CombatAbrasives.com. All right, back to work. I'm going to be making the handle out of a really unusual wood sent to me by one of my viewers. It's Texas Ebony, scientific name Ebonopsis Ebono. Like its more famous tropical wood cousins, it's a very hard, dense wood. Appropriate for a sailor knife, Texas Ebony is prized in Texas for use as fence posts because it's relatively unaffected by water and doesn't rot easily. I've been saving this block for quite a while for a special project and this seemed like the perfect one. After sawing the blanks out on my bandsaw, I flattened them on the disc grinder. It's important that the bottom of the scale is really flat so that it fits nice and tight to the tang of the knife. Once that's complete, I'll profile the front faces of the handle scales. This has to be done before installation because if you try to sand the scales afterward, you'll scratch up and ruin the blade. Next, it's time to grind the bevels on the blade. I'll begin with a nice fresh 60 grit combat abrasive ceramic belt. I'll run up through a sequence of belts to about 220 grit. Normal western blades are completely hardened, but this blade will be differentially hardened, meaning that the spine will be soft while the cutting edge will be fully hardened. As a result, the blade will feature a hamon, the wavy line seen on Japanese swords, which demarcates the unhardened from the hardened portion of the blade. We'll be clay hardening the blade. The process I'll use is much the same as that used by Japanese smiths, with a couple of minor modern modifications. First, I'll coat the tang with a thick coat of clay. In this case, not strictly clay at all, but a refractory cement known as satanite. Then I'll lay out a design on the blade. The practical effect is to make the blade more shock resistant, but Japanese smiths worked hard to make the hamon attractive too. In a perfect world, the blade will harden only where there's no clay, leaving a very clear design exactly like I laid out. In practice, this is a really violent and somewhat random process, so it just comes out the way it comes out. Once the clay is dried, I'll fire up the forge and heat the blade to around 1500 degrees in preparation for hardening the steel. 1086M is a close relative of W2, which may be more familiar to most knife makers. It contains 0.86% carbon and about a quarter of a percent of vanadium. I'll be giving it a compound quench with the blade going initially into water, then being transferred quickly to an industrial quenching oil. I use this two-stage process because it generally gives me a bolder and more detailed hamon than simply quenching into oil. A straight water quench gives the best hamones, but it also frequently results in cracked blades. So I developed this approach many years ago with the idea in mind of having the best of both worlds, and it generally works as advertised. So, now it's into the heat treating oven at 400 degrees for an hour or so, softening the steel slightly so as to make it less susceptible to chipping or cracking. Here's the blade after heat treatment. Pretty ugly still. I'll take it to the surface grinder next, 
flattening out any warping that might have occurred during heat treating and cleaning the oxides off before polishing. Hardly any warping occurred, so this just amounts to a couple of cleanup passes on each side. This could just as easily have been done with sandpaper, but my general approach is if I can avoid sanding by hand, I'll do it. Next, it's over to the grinder to even up the grinds and clean up the minor surface warping which always occurs during clay hardening. See those little dark patches along the edge? The steel in those locations warped a minuscule amount and will have to be ground down a little further to assure perfect flatness on the edge. The hamone has also become visible, running along the edge and then doubling back along the tip, just as it would on a Japanese sword. I'll mark the margins of the blade on the scales, then cut them slightly oversized on the grinder. That allows screw-up room when grinding to the final shape. A quick test to make sure everything fits. Now I'll polish the blade. This is one of the places where handmade knives and production knives diverge. This kind of handwork is tedious and grimy and time consuming and if it isn't done with a nearly fanatical attention to detail it really looks awful and you might as well not do it in the first place. One of the tricky aspects of a knife like this is that making a knife with a hamon requires that the blade be etched to bring out the features of the hamon. There are a ton of different ways to do this, but no matter what method you use, once the blade's been etched and polished, if you scratch it, abrade it, or grind it, the appearance of the steel is different between the etched and the newly ground part. That's why you almost never see this type of blade in a stock removal knife. I'm going to do an end run of sorts here and fit the handle on with locator pins, then carefully shape the handle to the knife. Normally this work can all be done after the blades attached to the knife and the margins of the knife will all be ground in more or less the final operation. Since this blade will be etched to bring out the hamon, however, it can potentially cause all sorts of problems. One slip, one scratch, one wobble, and you have to take the whole thing apart and redo the handle from scratch. So, I'll get the handle ground about 98% of the way with these temporary pins in place, then disassemble and complete the polishing. After polishing, I'll reassemble everything and hopefully end up with a nearly perfect knife with just a little cleanup and some sanding of the tops of the handle scales required for completion. Here I'm shaping the finger grooves. I've never been able to get them 100% perfect on the grinder. A matter of a half degree off and suddenly you're blasting away in the wrong direction. So I'll establish them on the grinder, then finish them up by hand using sandpaper stretched over a form made from an old shipping tube. What I'm aiming to do here is to make a sanding form with almost the exact radius of the contact wheel that I used to establish them with. If they aren't about the same radius, then your sanding block will end up digging a whole new groove with fairly unattractive looking results. Once that's complete, I'll etch the blade with lemon juice an approach adapted from my Japanese sword polishing techniques. Typically western smiths use ferric chloride to etch blades that they forge with hamones. The approach I'm using here takes about 10 times longer and yields somewhat less dramatic but to my eye more satisfying effects than the ferric chloride type etch. This approach picks up far more of the details of the hamone. The lemon juice is applied for about 10 or 15 minutes at a time, then washed off, then replaced with a polishing compound, with the process repeated until I get the effect I'm aiming for. Incidentally, if you're interested in finding out more about hamones, I've got a video available on my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, that goes into a lot more detail. It's really a complicated subject and something that I can't really do justice to in a video like this.
So here's where that ends up. Now I'll go ahead and assemble the knife using Rogue Epoxy provided by my faithful sponsor, Combat Abrasives. This time I'm using decorative mosaic pins as well as a brass lanyard tube. I'll use acetone to degrease the tang, then Scotch-Brite to scuff up the steel and help the epoxy adhere. Acetone also helps remove oil from the wood so the epoxy adheres better. Clamp it up, clean a little squeeze out, and let it cure. Once the epoxy's cured, I'll need to trim the pins and clean up a few minor bumps and scratches on the grinder. Then I'll give the handle a final sanding and polishing. Last comes a simple application of furniture wax, which I'll buff out to the final shine. Again, some interesting and unique challenges involved in bringing this from my client Lauren's original concept to its final form in this beast of a knife. If you're interested in finding out more about that process, I'll post a link to the video I'm making on the subject as soon as it's complete. And here's the final knife. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!